So today what we're going to talk about are um, 20 millimeter thick outdoor porcelain tiles and, and the different ways that they can be used, the different areas they can be used, and the different installation methods of each. Um, as as we mentioned earlier, I'm with Milestone Tile, which is a brand of Florum USA. Florum USA is a sister company to Florum, which is based in Italy. Um, our Milestone brand is made in Clarksville, Tennessee. Ooh. Why isn't this letting me forward? There we go. Um, here's information as far as the learning units that you'll get. Um, the health, safety, and wellness are our is part of the credit. We have AIA credits and we also have IIDA and ASID credits. Um, as was mentioned, if you log into the link through AEC daily, that's for AIA and you will get your certificate within about 48 hours. They're generally really, really quick about getting those out, which I think is always, always nice. So here's some things that we're going to talk about and, and hopefully learn by the end of the CEU. Um, we're gonna talk about, you know, why is porcelain tile considered a sustainable building product? Um, we're also gonna talk about the advantages of using a 2CM thick porcelain paver. Um, actually now we have pavers that have gone up to the 30 millimeter um, within the industry. Our company only produces 20 millimeter at this point. Um, 30 millimeter is, is relatively new, um, so we'll see if it actually takes off or not. Uh, we'll talk about the different performance characteristics with both visually and, and technically. We've come a long way in the last decade or so on aesthetics of, of tile. Um, makes it pretty exciting. We can actually make a tile look like anything you want. So it, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, we're going to talk about the different ways that you can install it, different foundation options, um, and then we'll talk about, again, the technical specifications and the certifying bodies that actually make sure that we are selling you the product that we say we are. Um, there's some, some folks that will sell a porcelain tile that may or may not hit where it needs to. Um, we make sure that all of our products are certified, so that's not, that's not an issue. So where does tile fit in? Um, really, it fits in anywhere you want. Um, ceramic tile starts off with essentially dirt. Um, it's made with red, brown, or white clay that's then mixed in. So essentially, it's like doing a, um, think of a cake batter. So you'll have different raw ingredients that will go into a tile that will then um, really allow it to be either ceramic or porcelain or, sorry, this beeps are kind of getting, okay, there we go. Um, that will actually create the, the end product that you want. And so some of the additives that you'll have, you'll have quartz, you'll have feldspar, you'll have sand. Um, it's really, like I said, it's, it's like baking, baking a cake. So porcelain tile is a form of ceramic tile. And what makes it porcelain is that it's fired at a higher temperature, which means that it has less absorption and a higher breaking strength than a ceramic tile. So what is a porcelain tile? It's defined by ANSI A137.1. And essentially what it's just saying is that a porcelain tile is less than or equal to 0.5% of moisture absorption when tested. So essentially that's making porcelain tile frost proof. And what that means is that because it's so dense and fired at such a high temperature, you don't have to worry about freeze thaw. So a ceramic tile, if you were to put it outside, especially in areas where um, there's a lot of snow or, or ice, it will absorb that and, and eventually crack. Because porcelain tile is so impervious to it, to moisture, that won't be an issue with you. So in your areas, especially where snow is an issue, ice is an issue, um, porcelain tile for outdoors is, is exactly what you, what you want. So the porcelain tile certification agency, otherwise known as PTCA, these are folks that actually test porcelain tile to make sure 
that they are exactly what we say they're going to be, that they're going to help hold up the way that you want them to hold up. Um, all of our boxes will have a PTCA certification mark on them, just so you can have the peace of mind that what we're telling you, we're selling you is actually what you are getting. With porcelain tile, safety is a pretty big thing. I mean, it, the cool thing with it is it doesn't absorb odor or smoke. So I've done porcelain projects that are in cigar bars. And, and if you're putting in a product that will absorb smell or smoke, it's going to stick within that, that finish. Porcelain tile won't allow that. Uh, it also doesn't support the growth of mold or mildew. Again, perfect for going outside. And it emits very low VOCs. Quite frankly, porcelain tile is, is your best bet if you're looking for a product that doesn't emit VOCs. Durability, durability with porcelain tile. I mean, it, it is extremely strong. Um, it's stain and chemical resistant. Nice thing if you're using your pavers outside and you spill a glass of red wine, or barbecue sauce or oil, it's not going to absorb that. You just wash it off. It's very easy to clean. And quite frankly, that is um, a characteristic of any porcelain tile, not just those that you're using outside as far as the pavers go. Um, it's scratch, scratch and scuff resistant um, and it's fireproof. Again, it's fired at such a high temperature. It is a fireproof product. Slip resistant, so slip resistance is important to everyone. We certainly don't want people sliding around on, on the porcelain tiles that are being produced. The ANSI standard, again, the A137.1, tells us where we need to be as far as that slip resistance goes. And we used to have a method called SCOF. Um, that was really, we used it for a long time, and you may hear, have heard the terms 0.6 wet. Um, that, was really where SCOF was. If you had a 0.6 wet, it was deemed to be okay for slip resistance and, and ADA. We now use dynamic coefficient of friction or DCOF, which is really, in my opinion, a much better test. Um, we use a, it's called the BOT 3000, and it is literally this little robot that runs over tile and will tell you the slip resistance of that particular tile. You get much better results, much more consistent results. Um, all of the products that we're showing you here hit a minimum of 0.42 wet, which is the minimum for the industry. Um, the majority of the products that we're showing you, actually, as far as the pavers goes, not the majority, all of them well exceed the 0.42 wet. So when you're talking about different types of tile, we will refer to tile as glazed and unglazed. And essentially a glazed tile has a vitreous coating on it. Um, almost a, like we're going back to the cake batter analogy, almost like a frosting that is then baked into the cake. Um, a surface color, it doesn't carry all the way through. Um, there's a lot of different design possibilities. Again, we can take a picture of, of your face and put it on a piece of tile right now if we wanted to. Um, and generally the body of the tile is, is tinted. An unglazed tile doesn't have that frosting layer. It's a, considered a through body tile where the surface color appears all the way through the body of the tile. Uh, we can then do a semi or a high gloss finish. Semi gloss finish would be called a levigato. Uh, or a high gloss finish is typically referred to as polished. Um, design possibilities are a little bit more limited, but when you're looking for an unglazed tile, um, think of things with a very high traffic area, such as an airport or a, a mall. Um, unglazed tiles have come a long way um, and are now much more beautiful than they used to be. Um, so really, it's, it's just a matter of where you're putting your product and, and what you're trying to achieve. Both glazed and unglazed are um, incredible products and will hold up really well. So the way that, that our industry determines shade variation is what we call a V1 through a V4. So if you hear someone say, oh, that's a V1 tile, um, it really means that there's very little difference from tile to tile. And really what 
I want you to think about is um, a wall tile, for instance, or a, a plain white or a plain black. That would be a V1. Then you go to a slight variation, a moderate variation, all the way up to a V4, which is a substantial variation. Um, and when you think of substantial variations, I like to think of uh, like a multicolored slate where you are going to have so many different colors and movements um, within the individual tile and tiles that really you need to see multiple pieces in order to understand the beauty of that individual collection. Uh, I would definitely caution you that if you're working on a project with something that is deemed either V3 or V4 to get multiple samples, um, so that you're not looking at a piece or piece and get disappointed when you install it and you see that there is a ton of variation in a particular product. So when you're looking at different products, we have calibration and we have rectification. And it's interesting to me that, um, that we don't talk about this more. So when you're firing a tile, you go from the raw materials and you put in your water and then you're, you're pressing it and firing it. And as you dry it and you remove that tile, the body of the tile shrinks. So it has to be sorted. So when it's sorted and it's a pressed tile, we say that it's calibrated. So the finished size of the tile is calibrated and it can be anywhere from a one all the way up to a nine. Um, you can use two different calibrations together. However, you wanna make sure that you're only going up or down by one number. So if you're going to order material and your manufacturer says, we have calibration five and seven, can you take them together? Your answer should be no, if you're trying to put them together in the same room or butt them up to each other. If they have a calibration five or six or five or four, they'll go together fine. Um, but make sure that you're only using that one up or, or one down, um, definitely if you're butting the tile together. Rectification, it's a cutting process where it goes back through and it's cut again and it fine tunes the tile to a fixed size. So folks think of rectified tile as um, the tile you get when you don't need grout joints or don't want grout joints. That is, uh, that's not, that's not the case. You have to have grout joints in any tile application. There has to be grout joints. The beauty of the rectification is because it's cut um, to that fine tuned size that if you have a perfectly flat floor or wall, you can have smaller grout joints than you would with a pressed tile. So when you're making your selections, you've got to think about your level of traffic. Um, a class O rating is wall tile. Wall tile you typically do not want to put on the floor. Um, certainly not something that we would recommend. All the way up to a class five, which would be heavy traffic. So again, think about um, the airports or the malls or anywhere where you're going to have heavy foot traffic, machinery going over it. Um, anything that, that is really a heavy duty commercial project, you're going to want to go up to either a class four or a, a class five. So where can tile be used? And really as crazy as it sounds, the answer is anywhere you want to put it. Um, we can put it in private spaces, public spaces, commercial spaces, residential, institutional, interior, exterior, um, wet or dry areas. You can put it on the outside of buildings. You can put it around pools. I mean, it really is um, a product that can go anywhere you want. That being said, when you get into different areas, we can see a porcelain tile um, can be used outside and it can, by definition it can. But you also wanna make sure that the finish tile or the texture of the tile supports what you are trying to achieve. You can have a porcelain tile that by definition can go outside, but again, you and we'll hit the slip resistance, but you want to make sure that you're putting it in an area that 
is safe and you're taking into consideration if it's going into um, a covered space or an open space, there's, there's all different types of, of things that you want to think about when you are specifying tile to keep your, your clients safe. So exterior applications, I, I love that we are getting more and more into that indoor outdoor living. I think that that's a trend that we're not going to see go away uh, and is really something that is popular coast to coast. I happen to travel the country and there's really not an area that I go to where people aren't looking for this aesthetic. Um, so porcelain tile has been out, used outside for a long time. Cold climates is again, I keep repeating that it's great for that freeze thaw because it does not um, absorb, absorb the moisture that a ceramic tile um, would. And again, with new design techniques, we can have a porcelain tile that looks like wood or concrete or stone, um, really, really anything you can dream up. Um, definitely want to always look for a product with the, the slip resistance. Again, 0.42 wet being the, um, the minimum. Um, a lot of times people will refer to R11 or um, even an R13 for outdoors. Those are not American tests, but definitely it is a higher DCOF and that's what you're going to see on all of these porcelain pavers. Um, and again, consider the suit suitability of the existing substrate. So what are you putting it on? Are you going over um, a wood deck? Are you going over you know, a, an old patio, a pool deck? All of these things come into play and um, need to be considered when specifying. So thick porcelain, thick porcelain came about, I would say, probably the first time I saw it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, and it was exciting. I think it was exciting to everyone. And when it first came, it was um, a little cost prohibitive. And really, we had a lot of landscape architects that were very used to using concrete or stone pavers um, and were a little hesitant. And quite frankly, that's still the case today. Um, although we are getting more and more movement on it and more and more requests for it. So the pavers that we have, they're 20 millimeter thick, so two centimeters, very thick, very, um, very heavy. Each piece, a 24 by 24 piece, um, typically weighs between 56 and 58 pounds. Um, they're specifically made for outdoor use. I, I suppose that you can put them inside should you want to, but there's, um, I can't really think of a good reason to do it, um, but you could. And they are different types of designs and there's, it's very versatile. There's different sizes, 24 by 24, eight by 48, 12 by 48, 24 by 48. Um, it, this particular product category with our industry is, is really exploding right now. So paving systems, um, just like any porcelain tile, you can use it just about anywhere. We've seen it done in gardens, terraces, patios, foot paths around pools. Um, one thing that we get asked quite often is, can I use this on my driveway? And the answer is no. Um, unless you're putting it over an existing concrete bed with a, um, or I'm sorry, concrete substrate with a mud bed. You certainly, we'll get into to some different ways to install the product. Um, you certainly, however, cannot drive a car on a porcelain tile that is installed over gravel or grass or especially, especially sand. So where can you use it? Again, we go back to public parks and dining patios, pools, wellness facilities, hospitality. Um, we're seeing it used in a lot of urban areas right now. Um, definitely is, as I said before, in public parks, we're doing a lot of pathways with it. Um, we're also doing a lot of um, flat top roofs with it. So multifamily in our industry is such a huge segment right now, and every building wants to stand out from another. So these porcelain pavers are perfect for a rooftop where maybe in the past it wasn't used, and now they want to turn it into some type of outdoor bar or oasis or um, really just kind of livable space. And, and these pavers are perfect for that. 
So the pavers are a mixture of the quartz clay and the feldspar. Again, we've talked about they're higher, they're fired at a really, really high temperature, which makes them impervious to moisture. Um, the sizes have changed a little bit. These says we have 24 by 24, 18 by 36, and 16 by 48. Um, we've actually changed those sizes. We now have 24 by 48, 8 by 48, and 12 by 48 as well. Um, they're considered compact monolithic slabs. They're squared and often rectified. Um, our particular company offers both, or, or I'm sorry, rectified and pressed. When we get into installation methods in a second, we'll talk about why that's important. Um, the rectified definitely needs to be used if you're using a pedestal system, but if you are installing just over grass, crush and run, sand, um, you can definitely just use a press should you decide to do that. So aesthetics, I mean, it, it's so crazy what tile looks like today. It's, it's always interesting when people say, I want tile just to look like tile. My answer to that is, what does that mean? Uh, because of the way that, that technology has changed and improved over the years, um, these pavers or any tile can look like anything you want. I've said that probably now four times, um, weathered hardwood, marble, natural hardwood, concrete, natural stone, really any aesthetic that you want to achieve um, can be achieved based upon the technology that we now have within our industry. So here's some test results for the performance of pavers. They're non-slip, thermal shock resistant, resistance to freeze, chemical resistant. Um, that's really important as well as when you're putting these around a pool, should you spill chlorine or bleach on them, it's not going to affect them. Um, and they're stain resistant and fade resistant, which is, which is great. Um, some other products are in the market are, um, will absorb stains and will fade with time. Um, the nice thing with these porcelain pavers is, is that's not something that you need to be concerned with. They're also mold and mildew resistant. You won't have efflorescence, breaking strength, uh, hits, the, the, all the minimums. Um, we talked earlier, actually before the call about the breaking strength of the pavers and it typically changes per production. Um, I'm waiting for the actual results of what ours come in at now. So if anyone wants those, let's circle back and I can get you the breaking strength um, after our, our call. Um, they're abrasion resistant, meaning if you are putting them outside and you're pulling lounges or patio chairs or patio tables, um, they're not going to scratch. You don't have to worry about that. And they are fireproof. So here's some cool things with, with the pavers. They can be installed in so many different, um, with so many different methods. You can lay them on grass or gravel or sand. You can glue them down with adhesive, or you can lay them as a floating floor. And so when we talk about a floating floor, that is the pedestal system. And, and we'll get into that more and more as we go on. Um, the pedestal system is great for um, actually running wires underneath your tile, any electrical, um, but it also allows for drainage. So you can take a sloped roof, use different types of pedestals, adjustable size pedestals, create a flat surface, but still have the ability for rainwater or um, any, any type of water, hoses, anything to drain um, appropriately, so you won't have an issue with stagnant water. So a couple things, outdoor porcelain versus concrete. Um, concrete pavers have been around for a long time. I, I don't see them going away anytime soon, but there are some things that to consider. Um, with the outdoor porcelain, you're able to really come up with as many looks as you want. I mean, the sky's the limit. Concrete, concrete can be unpredictable. I mean, the color uniformity can't be guaranteed, especially when you lay a pad of concrete, come back you know, a week later and lay another, chances are they're not going to match. Um, outdoor porcelain is frost resistant. Concrete is not. Um, outdoor porcelain is easy to install. Concrete requires some special installation. Outdoor porcelain is user friendly. It's easy to clean and is slip resistant. Um, concrete can crack. 
Drainage can be a problem. And in some instances, it can curl. Outdoor porcelain is highly resistant to chemicals and mold and mildew, everything we've talked about before. Concrete is not. Concrete is absorbent um, and it can stain. It, it, there is sealing that you can do with it um, as an act, added expense, but it can be done. It's also subject to scratching and wearing patterns. And outdoor porcelain is considered to be very low maintenance with a lot of durability. Um, concrete requires more maintenance required through its life cycle than porcelain does. So now as we compare outdoor porcelain versus stone, um, stone pavers have been around for decades, not even decades, centuries, um, but they require some maintenance that a porcelain tile doesn't. Um, they'll crack and pit where a porcelain tile won't. Um, in different installations, they require specialized labor and pre-sealing and thicker thin sets. Um, outdoor porcelain is typically very, very easy and quick to install. Um, stone absorbs water, it needs to be sealed, it's prone to stains, um, and it's also a little bit more difficult to clean and it needs special products, whereas an outdoor porcelain paver, quite frankly, it just needs water and a hose. So here's a couple different ways that you can install it. Uh, really, I think that laying in on grass is such a classic look. Uh, it can be installed with a minimum grout joint uh, and it can be removed and repositioned. We kind of laugh at outdoor pavers. If you're going to buy a house that has outdoor pavers installed on grass, you may wanna make sure that the homeowner is leaving them behind because they're very easy to, to pick up and move and, and take with you. So to install on the grass, you're gonna have your ground level. Um, you're then going to put in a layer of gravel for drainage, level everything off. You're then going to, to position the porcelain tile and you're gonna let gra grass grow in between it. Um, it's a very easy do-it-yourself project. Um, but again, in my opinion, this just has a very classic look to it. I think it's, it's beautiful. You can also do it over gravel or sand. Um, these pavers have been used at the beach to create a pathway between um, a sidewalk and, and the sand. Um, gravel is another what I deem to be a, a classic look. Um, and very, very nice for, again, your do-it-yourselfers. Um, you have your ground level that you're going to obviously level out. You're gonna have your gravel for your drainage and then you're going to place your tiles on top of it. Gluing with adhesive is something that, that definitely can be done. Um, we talked a few minutes ago about using porcelain pavers on driveways. And I said, if you were going to use it on a driveway, it definitely has to put down with an adhesive. So you're going to have a screed, um, you're going to have a, a great mud bed for it um, based upon there's several different methods and several different companies that that provide it. Um, and then you're going to install your your porcelain tile. Where I see this used more than anything is a floating floor. So back to that pedestal system. So essentially what it is, it's a suspended flooring system or you can create a walkover surface that doesn't rest directly on the ground. It's all on a raised structure. And there are several companies out there that make these different pedestals and will help tremendously as far as um, creating drawings for you, telling you what you need based upon pitch and, and everything else. If you need that information, we can certainly, certainly get it to you. Um, a very cool part of this is that you have that accessible space underneath so that you can run any type of, of wiring or electricity underneath the tiles versus on a deck, which quite frankly isn't, isn't the most pleasing look. Um, and these are easy to pick up and, and move around should you have any, any issues with them. So you've got a couple different pedestal types. You have a fixed pedestal, which is about three quarters of an inch thick. Um, you have a self-leveling 
If you look at all of them, they will have um, little tabs up on top that actually creates your joint space for the water to go through. Um, you have adjustable supports. Those are the two on the bottom. Um, if you look at the bottom right picture, you've got a step up with one size support and a taller support at the bottom. Again, you can take a, a surface that is not level and create a completely level space that is safe um, easy to clean, easy to maintain, and aesthetically beautiful. So as your lane is the, the floating floor, um, should you go over a certain height, and usually it's anywhere between three and four inches, some people even go down to two, some people go up to eight, it really depends upon the pedestals that you're using and the pavers and the specific project. Um, you're going to want to do a couple things. Either A, you can use um, a pedestal on each corner. That's an easy one. You can use a fifth pedestal in the middle to help with breakage. And then you can also go one more step further if you're going up high and do a fiberglass mesh or even a galvanized steel mesh, uh, or I'm sorry, galvanized steel plate on the back of the tiles. The supports are made from a very, very strong plastic. It can withstand harsh extremes of weather, UV, UV radiation. Um, they're very stable. There's also companies that will provide a tray um, if you're going up high on your pedestals and you are concerned with wind. Um, all of these things go into the specification of the particular product and your manufacturer and the pedestal company can certainly help you out with whatever you need as far as specifics. So the cool thing with these pedestals and, and crazy enough, I've actually done multiple floors with them, they couldn't be easier, is that once you get your drawing done, it's very easy to create your corners. Um, you, you really, I, I, I can't stress this enough, how easy these pedestals are, are, use, are to use. You have your grid, you put them down, you can score and snap them based upon you know, the, the actual installations and where, what you're going around, whether it's um, a quarter or a column, um, very, very easy to use. They also have little shims that, that can be used. So if you have a small difference in the thickness of, of tiles, you can actually have shims that are put in that will help you to be able to use different thicknesses with the pedestals and still achieve that, that flat surface. So environmental product declarations or, or EPDs, um, what these are is, I'll just read through it. It's a standardized scientific internationally recognized reporting format that contains verified information about the environmental performance of the building product. So essentially cradle to grave or cradle to gate, and it discusses its lifestyle, life cycle. Every product that we have um, comes with an EPD as really most companies in, or most manufacturers in our industry will have these available to you along with HPDs. Um, it's specific to tile made here in the States or in North America, not just the States. Um, it's certified and is available for use. It represents really 95% of all the tile made in the North America has these EPDs and your manufacturer will be able to, to supply those to you. For LEED certification, porcelain tile is great if your client or you are working on a LEED project. Um, we talked about the limited VOCs. Um, we talked about recycled content. Um, I think we've talked about recycled content. We may not have hit it, but the majority of porcelain tiles are going to have pre consumer recycled content. Some will also have post. Um, all of that goes into achieving that LEED certification. Obviously, tile's not just the only finish or the only part of a LEED building, but it definitely can contribute. So for the LEED V4 and porcelain tile pavers, how do they work together? Um, sustainable sites, so you can use them in open space or heat island reduction, especially if you are um, working in big cities. 
material or yeah. or your escrow license now is like tied to whenever your birth date is. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine that I was which has been like hi, can you can you move for us? Thank you. Um the life cycle of porcelain tiles is high. Um, it, it really is, again, the perfect product to use if you're trying to achieve a sustainable project uh, using a sustainable product um, and trying to get to those lead clarifications or classifications. Green squared. So a product that is green squared means that it meets a sustainability requirement. So you can say that you're green squared, but if you don't have the certification, you are not. Um, so products that are green squared certified comply with LEED V4, green globes, International Green Construction Code, NEHB green building, um, and they are definitely a standard for design of high performance green building. Um, all of our products have this, this certification. Um, definitely something to ask any manufacturer that you're working with and they can provide you with that certification. So the cool thing about the tile industry is really we're consistently looking for ways to be environmentally responsible um, up to and including becoming carbon neutral by 2030. So we are always looking for new advancement in technology, new ways to recycle product, new ways to get product to market that really is, um, is environmentally responsible as one can possibly be. It is really, it's to me, it's a really cool part of our industry that the fact that um, we're always looking for new and better ways. So that's really all I've got today as far as porcelain pavers and different types of porcelain tile, um, where you can use it, and, uh, and it really how it can be used to, to make the roar beautiful, but also environmentally responsible. So if anyone has any questions, you can certainly let me know. I can help you out or uh, we can follow up afterwards. You just- Jackie, we have a couple questions here. One of them is about the receiving the CU uh, documentation. Yes, everyone will be receiving um, information and uh, including the recording of this presentation, as well as the slides from the presentation um, and a registration button for our next CEU coming up December 15th, which is Sustainability in Thailand Stone. Uh, so yes, we will be sending out a notification. Um, if you have not signed up for um, through CEU Daily, uh, the link is in the, in the chat. It will also be sent out again, and it was in the original Zoom registration that will allow you to self-report um, for the credits. Um, and then we have a few questions as well. Um, how are the pedestal anchored in place? We have a project with a membrane TPO roof where we will be using the pedestals and I'm concerned for puncturing the membrane. You're going to want to talk to your pedestal supplier and they'll be able to give you all of that specific information. So we, um, there's several out there. I believe Schluter now has a pedestal system. Um, we've done a lot with Buzon and Bison, um, but your pedestal factories or pedestal manufacturers can help you out with that specific info. Great. Jeff, did you have any additional questions? Okay, we have another question from Leah. Uh, when installing in grass, the large spaces of grass, what is the maintenance of the grass that's recommended? Um, you can use a, um, a uh, an edger. You just have to be very careful because the edger could potentially chip the, the tile. So what you wanna do is grow the grass up to a point where it is higher, obviously, than the tile and maintain it um, yeah, just maintain it after that point with either an edger or a, even a weed cutter will work. Okay. You don't, you um, don't want to mow over it. Right. So I think we talked about that earlier, actually. Any sort of metal blade um, is, is not, not a good scenario. Yeah, you, you've really got to, and that's why it's so important to make sure that your grass, don't try to keep your grass even. With the pedestals, it needs to be a little bit higher. 
so that as you go through, you can cut it, maintain that beautiful look without chipping the tile. Okay, uh, one more question. Installing and raised pedestal system, would that be considered permeable? Mm, I don't really understand the question. Leah, did you wanna? Did you want to specify more of what your question is? Uh, um, sure. Whoops. We can hear you, Leah. Oh, you can? Okay. So uh, we run into a lot of situations in counties that um, where impervious surface is an issue. And so whether or not a pedestal system because the water can run through it somewhat like permeable pavers i just wonder if that would now create these this patio area to be considered permeable versus impervious uh i would imagine that it would the tile itself is impervious but anything below it could be could be deemed pervious or permeable Gotcha. Thanks. Okay, a uh, couple more questions. On vertical walls, what is minimum grout space? Uh, so vertical walls, I, I doubt you're gonna wanna use a 20 millimeter tile on a vertical wall, uh, but minimum grout space for any tile on a vertical application, it, as long as the tile is rectified and the substrate is flat, we would say an eighth of an inch. All right, um, let's see, one more question here. Linda, did you have anything else to add to that? No, I'm good, thanks. Okay, uh, another question here from Jeff. When specifying the paver, do you call out the amount of slip resistance desired? Uh, yeah, it's definitely something that, that you're going to want to check before you specify it. Um, again, they'll all hit that minimum of 0.42. Most, if not all, within the industry are going to test much higher than that, and your manufacturer can let you know that. So when you're creating your drawings, if, for instance, you need it to hit, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.65, what have you, um, I would definitely call that out in your drawings. All right. I think that's all for our questions. Um, does anyone have any more questions for Jackie? I do have one on grout lines between the between the porcelain pavers. Is there a minimum width that you recommend? And is there a poly, do you recommend putting poly sand in between it? And if so, is there a certain type or, or a specific type because of the thickness it, of them or? It's, um, okay, so the first part of the question is if you're gonna install it over, um, you're gonna do a mud bed, just like any other tile, if you're going to, if it's a flat surface and it's a rectified product, you can use an eighth of an inch grout joint. You can, I would actually suggest that you open that up a little bit more. Um, any sanded grout, whether it's Laticrete, Mape, Tech, whomever, um, will all work. But yeah, you're definitely gonna wanna use a, a sanded grout. Okay, um, one more question here. Is there minimum spacing for grass between pavers? There is, and you stumped me. Um, there is, and I can't, I can't re remember, I apologize. Um, That's if you wanna right. send it, I, yeah, I, I can get that answer to you after. I don't wanna yeah. guess. Elizabeth, we'll get back to you. I'll, I'll take, um, I'll write a note down and we'll, we'll send you a note. Okay. Yeah, give me about five minutes after we're done and I'll get, get you an answer on that. All right, a couple more questions. On the floating floor, you don't grout. How does that look? It actually, it looks great. So you'll have 
Um, again, the pedestals will have little tabs that will create your, your joints. Um, it looks good. We can certainly send you over some pictures if you want to, want to see what we're talking about. I think we're also used to, you know, all tiles having grout in between each one, that it is a little head scratching sometimes when we talk about not having the grout joint, or I'm sorry, grout in the joint. Um, but yeah, it, look, it looks incredible. It's beautiful. Great. Um, do we have any more questions? And feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask away. We've got Jackie here for a little bit longer. All right. Well, um, you are, we, we do have these products listed online as well as links to the virtual catalogs on realstone.com. If you visit our blog pages, um, all of the information is there. We'll be happy to connect you uh, with one of our sales team who are also very knowledgeable about these products. Um, and you can download project images, um, technical information, as well as any additional um, catalogs. There's a huge range of colors and sizes on these products. Uh, they are beautifully paired for exterior as well as interior products. So really great for indoor, outdoor, spaces uh, where you want a continuous clean line. Um, so that is at realstone.com. Um, and thank you all for attending. Thank you, Jackie. And that concludes our presentation.